Well, tell, talk a little bit about the Sa thing. Safe House and kind of what it's meant to you and the kind of support Coming that you here get here. To safe House. Oh, man. Yes. I used to always pass by this place and never knew that it was a safe haven for me. You know, and um, coming here with Ron, Miss Kim, Mr. Cleo, they have been an inspiration to me, you know, because they talked about, talk about their struggle through drug addiction, you know, and how they overcame it and how they're still overcoming it, you know, because it's a lifelong process, you know, and I didn't know that. And being able to sit around and listen to other people talk about their addiction, whether it's cocaine or alcohol or whatever their addiction, you know, it give gave me has given me a better perspective on how to, you know, accept my life, you know, and to deal with certain circumstances, and it makes me stronger, you know, because. Before, I wouldn't talk to, talk to people about my drug addiction. I was in denial for so many years, you know, because I've, I've been addicted for over 15 years, you know. And it's just, I just feel comfortable here, you know. And they and they shown that love to me to be able to come and sit and talk, not just with me, but with other people also, you know. So I imagine you're probably able to, because of your experiences, mm -hmm give support and advice to people who just yeah. kind of are new here and just walk through the door. Tell me some of the things that you might tell someone who just comes in here about about what they can do to help themselves and what advice you give them. I would tell them that if they're in a position where they're homeless or whatever, the safe house they have numbers, they have uh, outreach programs that they're involved with to help them, you know, the females and the males to get housing until they're able to get on their feet, jobs, opportunities, you know, to have someone come in and help with resumes and things, you know, it's just different opportunities, you know, that they can learn and get to feel better about themselves, you know, because it sure is helping, they, they need transportation, they they do that, they go through the process of getting the transportation to the best of their ability, you know, and it's just a great place, you know, and they get love and kindness. I tell people, first of all, you have to put God first. That's the main thing. You put God first and pray and be sincere about your recovery. You can conquer the world, you know, because God is good. So where are you? Where are you now in kind of in your in your journey and, and in your recovery? In my recovery, I'm 145 days clean and I feel great. Even though my health is terrible, I feel great inside. My self-esteem is back to where it should be. I feel beautiful as a person. I'm able to love myself again and love my family the way I should and other people and help to talk to them about how good it feels to be clean, you know, and to love themselves. And I just feel great. And it's being here at the safe house has helped me in that process, you know. So what's in the what's in the future for you? Say where would you hope to be in mm -hmm. and you know, maybe five years from now. What are five years from now? Your hopes and dreams oh, and goals. I would love to uh, to even be more clean, stay clean abstinence, you know, and to be able to help someone to get in a program to help somebody else and talk to them and to tell them about my testimony and about my life struggle with drugs and continuing to struggle with drugs. Now part of part of this will be in the paper and we're going to put these in the schools and so there there'll probably be some young people who will be watching this but what would what would you tell a young person in junior high school or high school who's presented with that opportunity, opportunity to that kind peer of pressure. yeah to first get involved what what advice would you give them don't do it you know you have so much more in life to look forward to you know it's a dead end road because I started as a teen you know smoking pot and taking a little sip thinking I was cool trying to be with the in crowd it's not it's, you're better off no I rather don't you don't want to be with the in crowd because that's not what your parents or what you should expect of yourself. Reach, go, reach your goal to the fullest. Uh, there's so much in life that God that's out there. Become a better person. And when they're presented with that that kind of peer pressure, who should they look to to get 
to get yeah. good advice and, and help? Um, first, tell the parents, and then if their parents not listening, pray about it and go to their counselor or somebody they, they can talk to, or go to a hotline or somebody talk to somebody that that's they want to listen to them. And you've mentioned a couple times about the importance of, of God and, and faith in your recovery. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about how important that has been to have to have that recovery. faith available to you? Oh yes, because um, during my drug addiction, I had my, I, when I lost my son, I had just went lost it mentally. I was in denial about my lose the loss of my child. I just started smoking, just going, just committing personally suicide. And I was bleeding internally. I had a my stomach was swollen. I had a bleed internally. They never knew. It. And when I did get, go to the emergency room, I was a day away from dying. My life, you know. And I was, I'm cut in half. I've been cut in half. I had a tumor the size of a six-month-old fetus. And I, they sewed me back together, you know, and it took God. I was laying there. I couldn't even wipe my own face. That's, I had no control of my body movements. And laying there in tears and praying. And God was sending angels in my room, people that didn't know anything about me, would tell me Christian things about God has forgiven you. You're going to be all right. You forgive yourself. And that's how God has helped me and he brought me. I had to learn how to walk all over again, you know. And it's just been one happy process at another, you know, as long as I stay, keep my faith in God and don't look back, you know. Can I you know that it's going to be all right. You mentioned the the loss of your son. Mm -hmm. Was that when things became started, very difficult? I started yeah, using drugs, mm -hmm. and I stopped loving myself and stopped loving others. Even though my family was there for me to help me, and they kept telling me, "You got to pray. You got to pray," because I come from a Christian family. And I was mad with God. I was mad with the whole entire world. I was mad, angry with women that had their kids. And I knew I was in college and working and was taking care of mine. Why did God take mine? You know, my only one. It was just a whole, I was just beating myself up mentally as well as physically. You know, like I said, it was a personal suicidal mission. And I didn't know it. I did not know it until that night I went, at, went into it. Shake. I went into a seizure, just started shaking, sweating, and I didn't know I was bleeding internally, you know, until the doctor got me in there, until I got there and laying on the table. He said, man, for another day, I would have dropped dead, and I know God has a purpose for me. And then the second time, with my accident, I was struck by lightning. I started back using again, you know, because I got depressed again, and I started back, and I was struck by lightning, not unconscious and I was par partially paralyzed from the waist down. I had no feeling in my, in my from the waist down and that's the second time God warned me that hey it's not what I want for you. I don't want you on drugs. You're a better person. And this time he has really got my attention and that's why I'm doing so much going through paperwork and stuff with the Social Security people and Medicare. They're still denying me, you know. I don't have any insurance. I have no income. I don't have a significant other, you know, to help me. I only have my family, but they have their obligations and stuff. But they still stick by me and stuff, and they encourage me. That's why I come here, to be able to talk to Mr. Ron, Kim, and Cleo. You know, I talk to them, and they encourage me, don't give up my fight. You know, because like today, I, I went to the rehab place, the center that I'm in. I talked, she throwed another stumbling block in my face. And I came here this morning and I talked to them about it. And I said, what I'm supposed to do, am I supposed to just give up everything, you know, because I done came so far, you know. They're still throwing stumbling blocks on the you know, brick walls up at me, excuse me. And uh, they said, don't give up, Glenda. Tell me not to give up, because I came too far. 
And when I think about it, I have came too far to let that one, let that one brick wall keep knocking me down, you know. And it just, it just, I'm, I'm okay with it, you know, because I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I feel good about myself, even though, like I said, the brick wall has been put up for me. I'm going to go home and continue to pray about it. And I know that I'm going to be all right. Because I fought so many battles. And I'm not a loser, I'm a winner. Well, it takes a lot of strength to even to get where you are now. Yeah, it did. And that's why I know I can't give up. Even when, you know, there's obstacles, you know, I got to keep on going. And as long as I can call these people here and talk to them, I either come here and visit or sit down. And with their encouragement and love and prayers, I know that I'm going to be all right. That, that makes me smile.